right, pull up a chair. We are now set for the closing <coughs> argument, the finale done by John Defense Guy ready? in courtroom 5D. Let's go back to Judge Deborah Nelson. Please be seated. <clears throat> Mr. Guy, you may proceed. Please report. Counsel. Good afternoon. The human heart, it has a great many functions, but is not the most important purpose what it causes us to do. It moves us, it motivates, it inspires us, it leads us, and it guides us, our hearts, in big things, like what we choose to do for a living, and in little things, like what we do every day, at any moment in the day. So if we really want to know what happened, out there behind those homes on that dark, rainy night. Should we not look into the heart of the grown man and the heart of that child? What will that tell us about what really happened out there? That's what was in George Zimmerman's heart. And the defense attorney can make fun of the way I say it. But it's not my voice that matters. It's yours. And we're about to hear from you. What does that say to you? Was he just casually referring to a perfect stranger by saying effing punks? That doesn't evidence to you anything? That's normal language? Or is that not what was in that defendant's heart when he approached Trayvon Martin? What does that tell you? It's funny, he put on a, a timeline that was uh, 10 feet long and the only thing he skipped was those two words at the bottom of the screen. It was the only thing. I think there was a reason for that. I think your reason he didn't want you to think about that again, how powerful that is, what that defendant was really feeling just moments before he pulled the trigger. I think that was a coincidence.
What was in Trayvon Martin's heart? Was it not fear that Ms. Gentile told you about? The witness who didn't want to be here? The witness who didn't want to be involved? But the witness, the human being that was on the phone with the real victim in this case, Trayvon Martin, right up until the time of his death. Was that child not in fear when he was running from that defendant? Isn't that every child's worst nightmare? To be followed on the way home in the dark by a stranger? Isn't that every child's worst fear? That was Trayvon Martin's last emotion. There's a old saying, great one though. As a man speaks, so is he. The words on the screen were the last thing these people said before Trayvon Martin was murdered. Before this defendant had a motivation to lie, to justify his actions, what were his words? What was in his heart? If ever, if ever, there was a window into a man's soul. It was the words from that defendant's mouth on that phone call. And if ever there was a question about who initiated the contact between that grown man and that child, it was again those defendant's words. When he told Sean Nofke, just have the officer call me on my cell phone and I'll tell him where I am. George Zimmerman was not going back to the car or the clubhouse or the mailboxes. And if there was ever any doubt about what happened, really happened, was it not completely removed by what the defendant said afterwards? All of the lies he told, all of them. What does that tell you? There's only two people on this earth who know what really happened and one of them can't testify. And the other one lied. Not about little things like his age or whether or not he went to the hospital, but about the things that really, truly matter. And not one lie. Over and over and over again. What does that tell you about what really happened out there? Why did he have to lie if he had done nothing wrong? The bottom line is, the bottom line, think about this. If that defendant had done only what he was supposed to do, see and call, none of us would be here. None of us. But that's not who he was. That's not where he was that night in his heart. After months of these people getting away. Not tonight. Not this one. Not that guy. That's why he got out of the car. If he really wanted the police 
to get Trayvon Martin, what would he have done? He would have stayed in his car and driven to the back gate where he had told them so many times they always go through the back gate and he would have waited for the police. But that's not what he had in his heart. Trayvon Martin may not have the defendant's blood on his hands, but George Zimmerman will forever have Trayvon Martin's blood on his, forever. Let me give you one more old saying. Maybe the most important one you're gonna hear. And that is, to the living, we owe respect. But to the dead, we owe the truth. On behalf of the state of Florida, I submit to you that Trayvon Benjamin Martin is entitled to the truth. And it didn't come from that defense mouth. It didn't. He told so many lies. That's why we're here. By the end of the night, that is what was in Trayvon Martin's heart. The defense attorney said, what evidence is there that the defendant followed Trayvon Martin after he said okay? He challenged the state. Well, I've got an answer. What happened after 1913-43 when that defendant hung up with Sean Naki in 19... 1544, when Rachel Gentel heard the thump and the end of Trayvon Martin's life. The defense attorney gave us a nice demonstration of what happens in four minutes. Well, what was that defendant doing for those two minutes? Watch the walkthrough again. Watch it. When he, because he, he, he tells you exactly where he hung up. He's walking back in the direction of the T, and he says, I got off the phone and I continued to my car. Maybe, maybe 10 seconds before he got to the T. It was two minutes. Two minutes. He wasn't going back to his car. Four minutes is not the amount of time that Trayvon Martin had to run home. Four minutes is the amount of time that Trayvon Martin had left on this earth. I don't, uh, I don't have any audio clips for you, or video clips, or charts, or, or, or big, long, 10 foot long timelines. I'm asking you to use your common sense. Use your heart. Use what you know is real. Use what you know you've heard and the law in this case. You know, and for the defendant, it's kind of like their, their little animation, the, the, the cartoon that they put up. Everything they want you to think in this case starts from the T. Just like their little animation starts from the T. Don't do that. That's not fair. That's not fair. It'd be like reading the end of a book, the last chapter only. And you'd be asking yourself, why are we here? How did we get here? Who are these people? You can't do that in real life and you shouldn't do it here. Let me suggest to you, you start at the beginning. 
Let's start at the 7-Eleven, where that child had every right to be where he was. That child had every right to do what he was doing, walking home. That child had every right to be afraid of a strange man following him, first in his car and then on foot. And did that child not have the right to defend himself from that strange man? Did Trayvon Martin not also have that right? I don't have all the fireworks, all the animation, but come, come, come back with me. Come back with me to that scene where it happened that night. Come back with me and bring with you your God-given common sense. The common sense that tells you it's the person talking like the defendant who had hate in his heart. Not the boy walking home, talking to the girl in Miami. Wow. The common sense that tells you if Trayvon Martin had been mounted on the defendant as the defendant claims when he went to get his gun, he never could have got it. I don't have to pull out that mannequin again and sit on it. You remember. If you have to, do it, in the, do it in the jury room. If he was up on his waist, his waist is covered by Trayvon Martin's legs. He couldn't have got the gun. He couldn't have. They wanted a reason? It's a physical impossibility. He couldn't have grabbed it. The only way that defendant gets to his gun the only way Trayvon Martin was getting off of him or he had backed up so far on his legs that he couldn't hit him, couldn't touch him. The defendant didn't shoot Trayvon Martin because he had to. He shot him because he wanted to. That's the bottom line. The common sense that tells you, if Trayvon Martin had already run off, like he claimed in his interviews, why would he go through the end of the T to get an address? If he had already run off, does that make any sense? Of course not. It's self-serving. It's justification. It's false. The yelling. Listen, please, please listen to that tape again. Jen, Jen Lauer's 911 call. Listen to when the screaming stops. At the instant of the gunshot. Silence. Nothing. If that defendant thought he missed Trayvon Martin, thought Trayvon Martin was still alive, so much so, that he had to get on his back, flip him over, spread his arms out. Why would he stop yelling for help? Why, if he was in fear? Does that make any sense? Of course not. If he was yelling that loud and that long, would he have sounded? The way he sounded on the recordings that you have, he wouldn't have been hoarse. He wouldn't have had a strained voice if that was him yelling, really? That's why common sense is so important. This isn't a complicated case. It's a common sense case.
And it's not a case about self-defense. It's a case about self-denial. George Zimmerman. The common sense that tells you if he was the neighborhood watch coordinator, not anyone, the coordinator, who had lived there for four years, he'd know the name of Twin Trees Lane. The common sense that tells you if he was so afraid of the real suspicious guy with his hands in his waistband, he'd have never got out of the car. But that's not what happened. The common sense that tells you if he really was soft, didn't know how to fight, in his own words, he wouldn't have been able to get risk control of Trayvon Martin. Those were his words. He wouldn't have been able to move his hand off his mouth or off his gun. If Trayvon Martin was putting on such a blow, that little plastic, flimsy kid's watch on his wrist, it wouldn't have come off. It didn't. The common sense that tells you, if Trayvon Martin was the one on the hunt, would he still have been on his cell phone? Would the earbuds still have been in his ears if he was getting ready to attack somebody? Really? And, and the most important one of all, the common sense that tells you in your everyday life, really, if he hadn't committed a crime, why did he lie so many times? <coughs> Why did he lie? Let me remind you. <clears throat> Sean Nofke told me to get an address. That didn't happen. Listen to the tapes. Listen to the walkthrough and listen to the non-emergency call. Sean Nofke never said that. <clears throat> I told the police I was going to meet about my car. That's not what he told them. Why? Why lie about that? It's so important, that's why. Because he wasn't going back to the car. He was going back to Trayvon Martin. Just like he said on that tape when he slipped up. Just like he lied about when he was confronted. It wasn't 10 seconds afterwards, it was two minutes. Trayvon Martin covered his mouth and nose. Really? You, you, they, they want you to believe that the blood was washed off by incompetent medical examiners. But yet he told the police, not just the police, his best friend, remember his best friend in the world, that Trayvon Martin was squeezing his nose. Do you really think if that were true, there wouldn't be George Zimmerman's blood on these sticks that they pried under his fingernails. Do you really think that's true? That was a lie. Concrete. You're kidding me. It's heavy. It's hard. If his head had been slammed into something like this, slammed, bashed over and over, he wouldn't like, look like he did in those photographs. Think about it. That would be it. Dozens of times, he said, dozens of times, punched in the face. That would be it. Was he injured? Yes. 
Was he injured seriously? Not close. Not close. I mean, they, they can call their expert and show him all the pictures of the lumps on his head. Were any of those serious? Didn't Trayvon Martin have a right to defend himself too? Remember Lindsey Fulgate? He didn't have so much as a headache the next morning. Not nausea, not vomiting, not a headache. And he didn't come to see me for treatment. He came for a note for work. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't bad at all. Would Trayvon Martin's hand look like that if he had been pummeling him? He said Trayvon Martin saw his gun. First of all, it was inside his waistband, inside. Second of all, Trayvon's Martin legs were covering it. He couldn't have got to it. Trayvon Martin couldn't have seen it. Do you think for a second, seriously, do you think for a second that if Trayvon Martin had seen that gun ever, there'd be a gunshot at 90 degrees in the center of his chest. Do you think that? I mean, Mr. Stay Puff, Mr. Softy, was gonna be able to get a shot directly through the center of his chest with Trayvon Martin knowing that gun was there, fighting for his life. Do you think that? Why was it so important to say he spread his arms out? Because he had to make Trayvon Martin menacing, violent, threatening. So I had to put his arms out. They weren't. They weren't. They were not. They were clutching the bullet wound on his chest. The car. He had to make him sound menacing to justify what he had done. Listen to those tapes again. There's the only two you have to listen to. The walkthrough and the non-emergency. Play them side by side right after each other. It's physically impossible the way he told the police. Impossible that Trayvon Martin ran behind those homes, came back and circled his car. Why is he lying? He didn't want to know about Stand Your Ground. Didn't want the police to know he knew about it. Stand Your Ground, what's that? And let me suggest to you, in the end, this case is not about standing your ground. It's about staying in your car, like he was taught to do, like he was supposed to do. And he can't now cloak himself with the noble cause of a neighborhood watch coordinator violate its cornerstone principle and expect you to absolve him of his guilt. He changed the story. This is where he told Detective Singleton he first saw Trayvon Martin. And this is where he showed him on the walkthrough. Watch the walkthrough again. Why did he lie about that? Why was it important that he came in through that cut like everybody else had he had told the police? That he came through the cut because he had to make Trayvon worse. Had to make him worse, more menacing. That's why he lied. He told some people Trayvon Martin said one thing, and then it got worse. He told him he said something else. He reached for my gun. Had to make it worse. So he told Mark Osterman, his buddy, no, he grabbed my gun. 
He actually he told him between the hammer and the back. Why? Why is he doing this? Told Mark Austin, man, he circled his car at the clubhouse. He told the police he circled it where he finally parked his car. He never circled his car. Told somebody he got his cell phone out. Told other people he was reaching for his cell phone. That's what he was taught. Don't, don't be a vigilante. Don't. See and call. Don't get out. Don't follow. Don't pursue. Don't try to detain. Just call. Just call. And they gave him a little special book. As the coordinator, what not to do? What did he do? And think about this. The defense referred to George Zimmerman as a responsible gun owner in their opening remarks. A responsible gun owner. What did he do after the shot was fired? Did he yell for an ambulance? Call 911? Get an ambulance here? I had to shoot somebody? Did he roll Trayvon Martin onto his back so he could breathe? He just stood there and he watched and he waited while Trayvon Martin was face down. The bottom line is, who is responsible for Trayvon Martin lying on that ground? Trayvon Martin didn't kill himself. And who's responsible for the state not being able to ask Trayvon Martin to step forward so I could put my hand on his shoulder? God, I'd love to do that. Who's responsible for that? And Trayvon Martin is not, was not, will never be a piece of cardboard. To the living, we owe respect, but to the dead, we owe the truth. It, it probably seems like a year ago that we, we were all in here, one by one, and then as a group, in jury selection. And one question got a smile from everybody, but it's important. When the attorneys asked you, do you understand it's not like TV? It was an important question, because it's not. And now you know, it's not like TV, where all the witnesses are well-dressed, well-educated actors and actresses. There are no Rachel Gentiles on CSI. And they don't call people like Kristen Benson, who found nothing and a fingerprint from the gun on Law and Order. It's not like that in real life. In real life, we give you everything. The good, the bad, the indifferent. Because when that defendant is entitled to a trial, he's entitled to a fair one. All of it. All of it. And now you have that. In Hollywood, they, they write it up the way it happens on Sunset Boulevard. But in real life, it happens just like it did on Twin Trees Lane in front of so many good, unsuspecting people.
And remember, if you get back there and you don't like some of the witnesses in the case, you don't like Rachel Gentile or Shipping Bow or the fact that there isn't this evidence or the fact that there isn't that evidence, ask yourself, who produced this trial? Who made up the witness list? Who created the evidence? Who chose the circumstances? Who chose the lighting? Who chose the time? Who chose the weather conditions? It wasn't me. It was the defendant. He chose everything. And that's why we're here. And that's why the evidence is what it is. But it is enough with your common sense. It is enough. And I'm not asking you to fill gaps. I'm asking you to do what you do every day. Start from the beginning. Get to the end and apply your common sense. And don't misunderstand me. Your verdict is not going to bring Trayvon Benjamin Martin back to life. Your verdict is not going to change the past, but it will forever define it. So what is that? What is that when a grown man, frustrated, angry, with hate in his heart, gets out of his car with a loaded gun and follows a child, a stranger in the dark, and shoots him through his heart. What is that? Is that nothing? That's not anything? Is that where we are? That's nothing? Well, that's not his call, and that's not my call. That's your call. And I submit to you, the oath you took requires it. Trayvon Martin is entitled to it, and that defendant deserves it. Defense counsel went through this with you. I just want it real quickly, because it is our burden. So indulge me, please. <clears throat> A person justifies the use of deadly force if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm. I mean, they, they can put this picture up. You know, they, they blew it up for you. It's, it's bigger than life size. It's color. That's the fact. That's reality. That's what he looked like that night. When you wipe the blood away, that's what he looked like. Did that man... Did that man need to kill somebody? Need to kill a teenager? They put up pictures of all the witnesses. They forgot that one. Defense attorney said in his, um, well, ask yourself, you know, if there's an issue about who lost the fight, ask yourself, who lost the fight? Who lost the fight? Who lost the fight? That's all evidence. Those are all facts. In deciding whether George Zimmerman was justified in the use of deadly force, you must judge him by the circumstances by which he was surrounded at the time the force was used. He was, they estimated, 18 feet away from John Good. He knew the police were on their way. He knew that people were opening their windows and opening their doors. And when he shot him, he knew Trayvon Martin wasn't on top of him, so he could get his gun. Under those circumstances, under our circumstances, did he really need to shoot? Did he have to shoot 
Trayvon Martin. No, he didn't. He did not. Before I get to reasonable doubt, let me just go through a couple of things in the time I have remaining that the defense mentioned to you. I wrote down a quote. He said, innocent itself is no protection. Exactly. It wasn't for Trayvon Martin. He said he could have gone home. The guy could have gone home in the same sense. He says, I guess, it seems. Why didn't he go home? Use your common sense. Did he really want to take this guy home with him to the residence where the only person there was 12-year-old Chad Joseph? Did he really want to lead the defendant to that residence? Just like the defendant said, remember? On the phone call, the non-emergency call, I don't want to give out my phone number. Why? Dennis Roots said there's no other option for the defendant, he, for everybody else there is. I mean, he had, to, he had to admit that. He could have done other things, but he said for the defendant, there wasn't another option. But consider this. This is so important when you consider his opinion. The only evidence he had, the only evidence he had about what was happening at the time the shot was fired was from who? Self serving statements from the defendant. That was his opinion based on that. And when I asked him, when I got on the floor, how could he get the gun? With Trayvon Martin on top of him, the words were, somehow, somehow. Like I said, if y'all have to do it, get on each other. You won't get the gun. You won't until you get off. Why give so many statements, the defense attorney asked. If, if he was guilty, why, why would he give any statements? Why give so many? Because he had to justify his actions, and that's why it kept getting worse. That's why by the time he got to Mark Osterman, it was completely different. That's why it kept increasing. That's why when he got to Sean Hannity, wow, it was God's plan. By the time he got to Sean Hannity, it was God's plan. The defense attorney mocked me. That's fine. Because I said he pushed the gun into his chest. He didn't. He didn't. It was a contact wound with his shirt. He didn't push the gun into his chest. A reasonable doubt. Is not a possible doubt, and a speculative doubt, an imaginary doubt, or a forced doubt. And it's kind of funny the way they do the instructions. They don't tell you what a reasonable doubt is. They tell you what it's not. But let me suggest to you, a reasonable doubt is something you can attach a reason to. Use this definition as guardrails for your deliberations. If you get back there and one of you says, well, maybe this happened, or couldn't this have happened? Or isn't it possible this? That's not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt needs to be two things. It needs to be reasonable, common sense, reasonable. And it needs to go to an element of the crime. If you have a question about something that doesn't go to an element of the crime, it, and Judge Nelson's about to spell those out for you, probably after the lunch break. If it doesn't go to one of those elements, it's not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable. Sorry, I apologize. I need to interrupt. 
and uh, approach the bench maybe for a moment. Okay. Or I can state it now. No, approach the bench. final arguments have been concluded. I will instruct you on the law that's applicable to this case. You will be taking that law back to the courtroom with you. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Judge. Listen to the court when you get the law. This is what she'll tell you. A, a non-reasonable doubt, something that's not reasonable, possibility, imaginary doubt, or forced doubt, must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty. Let me just address one more thing with you before I close. And that was, um, it was brought up actually by the defense. It was brought up by the defense in their summation this morning, and it was brought up by the defense in the trial. Not by the state, but by the defense. Race. This case is not about race. It's about right and wrong. It's that simple. And let me suggest to you how you know that for sure. Ask yourselves, all things being equal, if the roles were reversed and it was 28-year-old George Zimmerman walking home in the rain with a hoodie on to protect himself from the rain, walking through that neighborhood, and a 17-year-old driving around in a car who called the police, who had hate in their heart, hate in their mouth, hate in their actions. And if it was Trayvon Martin who had shot and killed George Zimmerman, what would your verdict be? That's how you know it's not about race. To the living, we owe respect. But to the dead, we owe the truth. What do we owe Trayvon Martin? 16 years and 21 days forever. He was a son, he was a brother, he was a friend, and the last thing he did on this earth was try to get home. This is the dead. The self-serving statements, the lies from his own mouth, and the hate in his heart, words that they can't now take back, the physical evidence which refutes his lies and the law that her honor is about to read to you, the law that applies to all of us and the law that applies to each of us, this is the truth. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I've going to read the jury instructions, but I want to give you a choice. Would you like to have these instructions read after lunch, or would you like to have them read now and then go to lunch? After lunch. After lunch? Okay, I will respect that. Um, please put your notepads down. Before you go to lunch, I want to admonish you again. You are not to discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anybody else. You're not to read or listen to any radio, television, or newspaper reports about the case. You're not to use any type of an electronic device to get on the internet to do any independent research about the case, people, places, things, or terminology. And finally, you're not to read or create any emails, text messages, tweets, social networking pages, or blogs about the case. Do I have your assurances that you will abide by these instructions? Okay, thank you. We'll be in recess until 2 o'clock. If you'll please put your notepads face down. <laughs>
Please be seated as council will approach the bench for a moment. An impassioned plea by attorney John Guy for the state imploring the people that this case is not about stand your ground, it's about stay in your car, imploring them.